Welcome to this edition of the Taisig Talks. We are broadcasting again live from the the Pre Building in the vibrant and lively Sporzone. Our team of today consists of my co-host Peter Spronk and our technical support team Maarte, Priscilla, and Florence. And my name is Miriam Siesling. We are very proud and honored to stage two speakers today, Marijn and Boris and Peter will introduce them properly later. Now, without further ado, over to Peter to introduce our first speaker. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miriam. First speaker is Marijn van Wingerden. He's an assistant professor at uh, CSEI in the field of computational psychiatry. Uh, he previously was the head of the social rodent lab at Heinrich Heine University of Düsseldorf where he investigated social decision-making in animals, probably fairly small animals. Mm -hmm. Already during that time, he specialized on recording electrophysiological signals. That was one of those tough words, you know. Uh, and also the intriguing ultrasonic vocalizations uh, that are transmitted between rodents during social interaction. He is also famous because he's the founder and president of the Dutch Brain Olympiad the Stichting Hersen Olympiade Nederland from 2018 onwards. In his current research, he focuses on the analysis of neural activity of bigger animals, namely humans, <laughs> to predict their social behavior. Today, he will talk about data science in healthcare. Marijn, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Peter and Miriam, for the introduction. Um, yes, I will. Uh, there is a connotation between uh, rodents, especially rats, and healthcare, of course. It's, it's usually a bad one, but I won't be talking about rats uh, in this talk. Rather, uh, the talk is about data science applications to clinical data, so data collected uh, by GPs or by uh, hospitals in this case. Um, so just to briefly uh, illustrate the, the, the thinking behind um, uh, this field of work, is that uh, the promise of using AI in the healthcare field is that we can arrive at precision medicine, um, namely uh, identifying which treatment works for uh, which uh, segment of the population. So illustrated here, you see the uh, typical sort of use, um, treatment as usual, a particular list of treatments is worked down in, uh, in a particular order based on what generally works for most people. And, possibly also by their side effect profile. And um, if, a, if the most preferred option doesn't work for a particular person, you just go down the list until you get to uh, one that hopefully does work. Now, ideally, we would rather predict which um, treatments, uh, either medicine or maybe um, uh, uh, psychological treatment, for example, psychiatric treatment, uh, which, which treatment would work for which person so that they don't have to wait for the appropriate healthcare that long. And in order to make those predictions, uh, we would arrive at, um, uh, we would look to, look to AI models, machine learning uh, to, to make those predictions and just arrive at the personalized healthcare. Uh, so there's opportunities for AI in healthcare. There's usually large amounts of data that are stored in hospitals and other uh, care facilities. Some of it is well-structured, for example, imaging data like CT or MRI scans. There's also the international classification of diseases that provides a taxonomy um, so that it is very clear which uh, patient suffers from which um, condition. Uh, and there's, an, there's an, a large opportunity for uh, what I would call smart triage. So uh, trying to figure out which patient is most in need of uh, a particular care. And this can be implemented in decision support systems so that you can maximize the, uh, the benefit of care with limited resources uh, like staff but maybe also technical resources. Now, there's also a lot of challenges, of course. Uh, a lot of the expert knowledge by clinicians is actually hidden, um, so not uh, uh, immediately present in tabular data. It might be hidden in unstructured clinical uh, reports, or 
in a translation that is being made by the clinician to go from what they see uh, at the bedside into a classification scheme that is then used in the in the in the machine or in the in the reporting, and that might not accurately uh, uh, capture data. There's possible data ambiguity when data has been entered later in the day, uh, maybe with some hindsight bias. And usually it's pretty difficult to uh, translate findings from one hospital to another, for example, unless the scanning apparatus, for example, is very well uh, and the protocols are very well matched. But this is quite a challenge. Uh, so out of sample validity uh, is difficult to achieve. I wanted to talk about the WeCare collaboration started by um, ETZ Hospital and uh, Tilburg University under the IMPACT program, uh, which was um, which basically brings back brings together clinicians and AI researchers uh, um, and others to identify um, areas for collaboration where data science and artificial intelligence might uh, benefit uh, clinical care, and this is one of the subfields that is highlighted under the uh, WeCare collaboration. The, what I will be talking about is two projects. Uh, one is using artificial intelligence to predict the outcome after trauma for weak care, and if there's still time, uh, and data-driven clustering of psychiatric symptoms in a population cohort that was collected in uh, data that was collected by the Rotterdam study in Erasmus MC. And then we also have a shared uh, uh, project to discuss at the end of this, um, this talk, uh, this session. So the first project is about predicting self-reported outcomes after trauma. So uh, we know that, that mortality after trauma incidents has dropped sharply with uh, the advent of better care, but still there is uh, a large difference in recovery profiles between individual patients, so how, they, how well they recover after trauma. And this is captured in subjective quality of life ratings that address both um, subjective physical uh, revalidation and a psychological recovery, basically. And the goal of this project would be to see if we can predict how well a certain patient recovers in order to provide them with information at the beginning of their of the trajectory, both to set expectations and maybe to inform some shared decision making. So the data set that we use for this is the Brabant Injury Outcome Surveillance Study, a large uh, data set that uh, used longitudinal data, data collection in collaboration with the trauma registry and NAZB. And there are five follow-up samples after the initial hospitalization in, uh, in one of the medical centers in Brabant. The measures are uh, self-report scales, the Euro QOL five dimension score and health utility index. And there is a de depression and anxiety, anxiety scale as well. Uh, on the slide in below, you can see the, the co-authors uh, on this project, uh, which is, um, uh, so this is the, the description of the of the study. Uh, this is the protocol. So you can see here the five measuring uh, moments, basically when all of these questionnaires were uh, taken uh, from the participants, and all in all, about um, somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half to two thousand records are retained across the five uh, sampling points. Now, previous approaches looked at predicting the uh, precise values uh, of these self-report scores with the varying success. So uh, R2, um, R squared uh, scores ranged between 36 and 48% overall. And this was on the physical indicators only. And in this approach, what we wanted to do is to see if we can actually detect patterns in all of these variables that were measured at the same time on different intervals after trauma uh, jointly. So by clustering on the longitudinal data that consists of uh, four plus two outcome measures. So what we want to achieve is to have a limited number of clusters that we can then use as targets for prediction in a supervised uh, machine learning approach to see if we can predict those from baseline measurements and demographic data. So for longitudinal clustering, we used a couple of methods. Uh, one of those is uh, KML3D, an extension of uh, K-means clustering, a Bayesian method called HD Classif, a Gaussian mixture model, and also a longitudinal autoencoder. And here's an example of you know, how to make a decision on what is the optimal number of clusters. So one of the ways in to which you can do that is looking at the gap statistic, uh, but also the Bayesian information criterion, BIC, is sometimes used to pick uh, to this, yeah, so select the optimal number of clusters um, uh, for your clustering solution. Uh, here in the bottom, you can see the, the co-authors that contributed to this paper that is now uh, has been submitted. Uh, 
So here are some of the recovery profiles. We see an example here with six clusters and um, the scores range from, uh, so they, they take into account a pre-injury baseline. And then you can see recovery over the six uh, measurements, measurement moments basically, uh, with quite some uh, disparity between outcomes, between cluster one with the best outcomes, so near, near complete recovery versus cluster six that has rather poor outcomes. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we see a profile for um, HOTS anxiety scores. In this case, lower values are better. So on the left-hand side, we see uh, a group that didn't have much anxiety, but actually also reduced their anxiety after injury. And the top, rent, uh, top, high, top right hand side is a group that had quite severe anxiety and actually didn't improve at all uh, over the course of this measurement period. So there's quite some disparity there. Um, so we, uh, we use supervised classification for cluster membership. And um, so here are some, some example uh, to disambiguate between different uh, or make a selection between different kinds of models. We looked at models that have relatively high accuracy, uh, also have a high clinical sensibleness and a low majority baseline. So the groups, the clusters that we find need to be um, sort of evenly spaced across the sample so that the different clusters are actually meaningful. And it's especially this meaningfulness was also um, uh, dis discussed with um, uh, the help of clinical experts. So here we see a uh, visualization of our approach. Uh, we first selected uh, plausible models based on criteria such as the gap statistic and BIC, and then uh, applied machine learning metrics for supervised classification. And then we asked the clinical experts whether they thought that the different um, clusters that came out were actually clinical, clinically sensible. And what we mean by that is that do they conform to known risk factors, for example, for known uh, for subjective uh, recovery profiles? For example, having a hip fracture is uh, considered a really bad um, or a predictor for bad outcomes uh, uh, in comparison to those people that don't have um, hip fractures. Now we see here visualization using uh, these stochastic neighborhoods embeddings. This is Kind of a bad example, we see that uh, the clusters are not very well separated at all, and there's there were also solutions where this was much better. Um, so clinical sensibleness is here explained a little bit more. We can see on the right hand side this arrow uh, showing that between the different clusters, so the different rows in this table, we actually see the percentage of hip fracture uh, change quite a lot. Um, going from sort of the best outcomes in cluster one to the, the worst outcomes in cluster six. And this also recapitulates an, an axis on age, for example, we can see that as well. So the, the, the mean age is increasing in cluster clusters and the number of comorbidities as well. So this clustering solution actually recapitulates a lot of the known uh, risk factors and therefore was judged to be clinically sensible. So the conclusion here is that we can actually do longitudinal clustering of patient reported outcomes, and we can predict that with reasonable accuracy from initial hospitaliz hospitalization data that includes both demographic data, but also um, pre-injury health scores. The clinical assessment is essential for a sensible cluster. So we really depended on our clinical partners here to, uh, to pick the best models basically. And now the, the challenge is to, do, to go towards an implementation. So the goal would be to make a dashboard maybe for um, uh, for, uh, for this uh, visualization that can be used to set expectations for patient recovery, both by the patient and by the clinician, maybe discuss potential interventions. If there are risk factors that are uh, predicting a bad outcome, maybe you want to start with um, uh, psychological tre treatments or care uh, or physical therapy early on. And um, we think that, for example, reporting the probability of ordered cluster membership we be a good way to do that. So, you know, give like, give like an um, a probabilistic forecast of where what the expected recovery profile would look like, and then basically engage in a discussion with the patient what you know what they think about that. Um, the second um, project, if I am good for time, I will look at the moderator. Yes, um, we have another project uh, which also looks at clustering, but this in this case longitudinal clustering of psychiatric symptoms in population cohorts. So this is uh, based on the Rotterdam study, uh, a project and that is called ERGO as well, um, where uh, a large neighborhood in Rotterdam was uh, uh, evaluated in many waves 
and there's a lot of information uh, on that. So the problem with classification psych of psychiatric illness, according to DSM, um, is that usually it proceeds by scoring a number of symptoms that are being endorsed by the patient or by the clinician. Uh, but to arrive at a similar diagnosis, you can actually have quite disparate groups of symptoms that uh, bring you to the same diagnosis, for example, of major depression. So um, there's, a, there's a problem there that um, people who have the same sort of outcome, clinical outcome, can actually display rather different symptomatology. And also symptoms can be shared by diagnosis. So we want to see what would, look, what would happen if we would just look at the population and see how those symptoms that are being assessed co-occur naturally and see if we can find clusters that are maybe uh, a little bit different. So what we did is we took uh, symptoms from three uh, um, validated scales that have been uh, assessed by the, um, the people looking at the Rotterdam study and performed hierarchical, hierarchical cluster analysis. And uh, the summary of this is that actually those items from the different subscales do not cluster nicely in their own scale, but rather interleave and mix. So we can see that um, the similarity between cluster endorsement, between symptom endorsement, actually transcends these uh, questionnaire boundaries. So some of the anxiety subskill items cluster better with depression uh, items, etc. Now, when we did that, um, we arrived at these profiles for different participants. Um, and actually, uh, let me just go to the uh, conclusion here, is that we found that when we looked at patients who have a known diagnosis, that those diagnoses actually transcend the boundaries that we can find, find here uh, generated by data-driven clusters. So the data-driven clusters, basically looking at really the co-occurrence of these symptoms in the population, uh, really don't, do not match uh, nicely with, um, with the boundaries of, of uh, traditional classification of diagnoses, basically. We can see that here, the red patients are those with anxiety and they are basically all over the place in this cluster space. So the conclusion here is that um, there might be a need for epidemiologically defined clinical subgroups. So maybe there are subgroups to be found in the anxiety and depression cluster that, uh, are, um, that can be defined by their epidemiological profile. And they might actually respond to different treatments, for example. We don't know this, but this comes back to my first slide. And maybe there is a personalized treatment for those subgroups as well. Um, there are some open issues that we don't know uh, that much about. One of those is, for example, whether these clusters are stable over time. And that relates to um, the, uh, our second speaker also, the, maybe the analysis of, uh, of these profiles as time series. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, I want to you know, thank my collaborators at the hospital and uh, at the Rotterdam Erasmus MC for collaborating here. Thank you. Thank you. So let me ask a quick question because I see there's nothing yet in the chat, but if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, please raise your hand or type it in the chat and I will communicate it to uh, Marijn. Um, but I was looking at your first um, set of um, uh, your first research and what I see in there that is a, a lot is about uh, treatment. Um, so you try to find the best treatment for people who start at a certain stage in an accident or in something where they need to be treated. Uh, but I also saw that, well, for many of them, so you have these six clusters and these clusters they start at a certain point and these, many of them start at different points. So that means that you can already early make a prediction on where this will go. But for some of them, that wasn't the case. They started at the same point, but only after the third measurement or so, they 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 started to diverge and they turned into different clusters yeah. so is there does that mean that they started already out with the wrong treatment or what what is happening there so how early can you make such a prediction where it goes and would it still be possible to make adaptations uh, to it yeah so what i didn't show here but uh it's kind of interesting the more data you take in so um that you could take a start in with the pre-injury data but then also the first week and maybe the first month the more data you take in the better the prediction becomes obviously uh, but then it's less useful because you're already down the trajectory somewhere so the most interesting cases are those clusters where they start off at a similar um uh, reduced uh, uh, recovery profile and then start to diverge like like you mentioned 
And so in order to cap capture that divergence, um, we actually need to observe the entire uh, time series here. So for a new, a new patient, we don't have that data, but we do now have this supervised model that basically assigns a probability of this person ending up in a relatively, you know, well recovery profile versus maybe a poorer recovery profile using only the data that's already available uh, after the initial hospitalization. So it's in time basically to still make changes.